Hello, everyone, and welcome to the very first IGEL Community Technical Webinar. This is the first of many webinars we'll be doing with the IGEL Community, where not only do we bring on the amazing partners IGEL has, such as our guest for today, Device Trust, but we're also going to be working with the IGEL's product management team and our SEs to share with you technical deep dives. Maybe, for example, how to install the products, how to troubleshoot the technologies, and so much more. Really, the sky is the limit, and I thank you so much for joining, so stay tuned as there's so much more to come. That being said, if you're not already an IGEL community member, then please join. This is just many, one of many great resources you will find within the IGEL community. We're sharing the latest IGEL product announcements, of course, tech, upcoming technical events such as this one. If there's a new white paper, we'll let you know about it. If there's a new support article out, we'll let you know about it. And we're also about to release GitHub integration as a place for the community members to download and share their scripts, profile examples, etc., etc. And last but not least, at the end of last year, we released the IGEL Community Slack channel, where just in a few months, we've received over 4,000 different messages float back and forth, but they're all perfectly organized. The group is broken down into channels based on the different iGel technologies. So for example, if you have a question or a comment or you want to share something about the iGel OS, you can head on into the iGel OS channel and you'll find like-minded folks that are doing just the same thing. It's really amazing and I can't believe the success and the feedback we, we've been receiving about the iGel Community Slack channel. So how do I join? Real simple. There's three different places you can find us. Uh, head on over to our Twitter account, at IGEL Community, real simple. Within there, you'll find links to the different things I'm about to tell you about. The first are LinkedIn group, IGELcommunity.com. We'll actually redirect you to a LinkedIn group. Within the link, LinkedIn group, you'll find just basic messaging. Hey, there's a new webinar with Device Trust today. Join it, right? Here's a new white paper. Download it. And, of course, you're going to find links to our Slack channel because Slack is sort of interesting. You need a actual specific link to join. So join that or head over to the IGEL Community Twitter account and click on the very top pin article, click the link, and you'll be directly into that Slack channel. So those are the three locations we have today. I hope you guys can join. So on that note, let's get on with the show. Today, I'm so happy to have one of IGEL's newest partners, Device Trust, with us. Device Trust is the makers of an amazing contextual security solution that when coupled with the IGOS will allow you to define security based on the user's context. I will let them explain what this means in details, but it is truly a very exciting partnership and we're seeing a lot of interest from our customers and of course IT itself. Gr really great technology and they, they stand on their own two feet. So you don't require iGel to work with device trust. And of course, these guys will explain that. So with no further ado, let's dive into it. I think you will like it. And do stick around to the very end as we have a few special surprises that we will share with you at the conclusion of this webinar. On that note, on with the show. Jens, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Thanks, Doug. So again, very warm welcome to everybody on the session. Um, as Doug mentioned, um, clearly the the, the main topic is to give you a technical overview about device trust what we are doing and how we are doing it but i really like to to do a quick very short introduction um, into what we mean by contextualizing it and um, what's behind it and how it uh, guides into into contextual security um, so as Doug already mentioned, Device Trust is a German software vendor. We are based in Darmstadt, which is which is close by to Frankfurt, um, founded end of 2015. And what we are doing is, as I said, is contextualizing IT. Just a quick quick step into into our alliances, and I just want to point out two on, on here. Um, so one clearly is that, that Device Trust solution is completely Citrix ready certified for for all Citrix products as six Zen App, Zen Desktop, and Netscaler, and also and that's what um, yeah the the purpose of this of this today web sessions is we have a strong alliance with, with IGEL. So what it means is that part of our software, of our client software, is is already pre-installed, embedded within the IGEL OS, um, beginning with version 10.3.500. So our, our component is already implemented into the into the IGEL um, OS. Let's 
dive a bit into it, what, what we mean by contextualizing IT or what where, where it comes from. So when we look at the desktop virtualization market or virtualization market, then clearly um, we have we have users um, using their desktops, using the SIM clients to access a virtual environment, to work with their applications, to access their data, to work with their resources they need to do for their day in, day out work. Clearly we have different type of management solutions which are used um, to apply um, policies, um, access rules, if a user logs on to this virtual environment, to his workspace, that he gets access to the applications, to the data he needs for his day in, day out work. Um, and, and clearly to fulfill the existing requirements we have in the businesses from a security standpoint of view, from a compliance and regulatory standpoint of view. When we look a bit back then, this condition set, so what kind of applications and resources the user is able to access is mainly based on the, on the role of the user within the business means if a user is part of the HR department, then clearly he gets granted access to all resources for the HR department, like applications, data, and so on and so on. This all worked out very well in the past when users were working with these virtual environments in a, let's say, more static approach, sitting at their desk, sitting at their desktop PC or the SYN client and working with these environments. What happened over the last couple of years and, and what kind of business are requiring at the moment or since, since a couple of, of months and years already is that people now start using different type of devices, even if they are managed, unmanaged, BYOD devices, um, as well as they're working from different locations, using different type of networks. And also what's quite common at the moment is that external people need to have access to, to virtual applications, to, to data within the, within the corporate environment. The big challenge is that the role of the user to grant or deny access to specific resources isn't enough anymore to fulfill the existing set of requirements we have in place. So what, what, we, what we see out there is that businesses, IT departments need much more detailed information about the context. So where a user is accessing, accessing from, um, what kind of device he's using to, to be able to grant or deny access to applications, as I said, based on the on the context. So when we look at, and that's what we mean by contextualizing IT, when we look at these security compliance and regulatory requirements, then it's mainly two areas um, which are which need to be considered. One clearly is, and that's the main topic for today, is contextual security. In, in summary, it means is the device the user is using, is it secure in my terms, in my definition? Um, also, is the location the user is accessing from, is it a secure location in my definition? And last but not least, is the network the user is using a secure network that I can grant access to specific resources within the virtual environment? On the other hand side, we have what we call contextual user experience. Um, what it means is, does the user have access to all the resources he needs in the context he's accessing at the moment? So easy example, does he has the right printer based on the location he's accessing the virtual environment? To fulfill all these requirements and to be able to apply contextual security and contextual user experience. And that's exactly what Device Trust is doing. We need um, more detailed information about the context when a user is accessing this environment. We have categorized this in five main categories and clearly Sasha will go into more, more deep information um, on his live demonstration later on. So one clearly is information about the hardware the user is using to access the environment. So having detailed information about the device to identify the device, is it a corporate owned device? Is it a non-corporate owned device? Does it meet the hardware specific requirements for accessing the virtual environment. Secondly, we have information about the software which is installed on the device. When we look at, for instance, in Windows devices, it's about the security components which are implemented on this device. Is there a firewall? Is there a virus scanner active? Um, is a important critical security patch missing on the device, which I need to know um, and decide um, if, I, if I grant access to the virtual environment or not. And then, of course, information about the network. Um, network means 
internal network. So if the user is within the corporate network, I want to know, I need to know in which area of my corporate network he is at the moment. So is he in, in New York or is he in Frankfurt or in which location of my corporate network he is at the moment? And if he's accessing from outside the net, outside the corporate network, what kind of network he is using? For instance, is he connected with the Wi-Fi network? Does the Wi-Fi network meet my requirements in security? So is it a, an encrypted Wi-Fi network connection or is it an unsecured Wi-Fi connection? All these kind of information. Also very common in use is, is the location the user is based. So we're talking here about the geolocation and which country the user is at the moment when he's accessing. Um, uh, quite often used for, for compliance um, um, requirements to, to be able to grant access to applications which are only allowed if the user is within a specific country. And last but not least, information, detailed information about the user itself. So is there a user certificate installed on the device we need? Um, does the user have or what kind of privileges the user has on its device um, when he's accessing the virtual environment? All these Detailed information is something we as device trust collect and then give it into the existing management framework um, so that, that the existing management framework is able to use this detailed context in combination with the role of the user and with our context. And also what we are adding is what we call device trust actions and triggers um, is the ability to to act on any kind of change of the context when the user is already connected, for instance, with the virtual environment. So if, if something happens or changes on the endpoint in the context, that we are able to act on this within the virtual session um, and, and to fulfill our existing requirements um, as stated um, on the security compliance and the regulatory side. So that was already the short introduction. So I would like to, to hand over to Sasha to give you a yeah, technical overview, showing you some, some use cases, what you can achieve with it, and what the benefit is um, by using the context within the virtual environments. Thank you, Jens. Just a check, Jens, with you. Did you see my screen with device draws in the background? Now I can see it, yes. Perfect, great. So let's get started. So as Jens was saying, we are already part of the IGOS, and the first thing I like to do is to show you exactly that. So what we what we will see here, this is our IGL uh, UMS server. Sorry, that was the wrong button. So where we are, external, come back here. So this is our IGL UMS server. And um, so what I'm using for my demo here is a UD5 and a UD Pocket later on. But um, Device Trust is, uh, as I said, already part of the IGL OS. Uh, for example, for uh, RDP or for ICA, there are specific um, things where you can enable that. So under sessions, in this instance for RDP, RDP global, mapping, device support, this is something where you just enable device trust channel. And that's the only thing you need to do on the ITRO side. The rest um, is, uh, yeah, is managed by us. So we need also a piece of software on the Citrix server we are connecting to, but I explain that later on how that works. So well, the first use case I want to demonstrate to you, I'm using a UD Pocket. So let me shadow my UD Pocket to you. And maybe I can make this, so, this better. So we have a clean, clean screen now. So here you see UD Pocket. UD Pocket is plugged in in any kind of hardware, is booted up. Um, and what I'm using here in my first instance, in my first demo, so let me remove this away as well. So perfect. Uh, I want to demonstrate, first of all, conditional access with device trust, conditional access based on the context. So we want to control access to my Citrix environment based on the context. Important for the demo now, I will only use Citrix, but we work 100% the same for Microsoft RDP. And we're also working uh, for published applications as well as for published desktops, but I'm using only published desktops because I want to demonstrate to you how we integrate and it's far easier for me if I use a published uh, desktop. So in this instance, the first thing we like to do is we want to control access, as I said, uh, to our virtual environment based on the Wi-Fi network. This is what we want to do now. So I'm currently uh, connected with my home office uh, Wi-Fi called Chicken Home. And this uh, network, if we can see here, this network is secure by WPA2. It's encrypted. So this is, by my definition, a secure Wi-Fi network. So what I'm using now, in my instance, I'm using uh, a directly storefront uh, access. So let me sign in with a user. 
But again, for us, it's uh, it's not important what kind of network you're using um, between uh, the endpoint. Let me just put in my something missing here. Letter HR use case 15. So for us, it doesn't care what kind of uh, network connection is between uh, the endpoint and your Citrix site. Is this through NetSkater? Is this through LAN? Is this through a traditional VPN? We don't care. So in this instance, what I'm doing, I'm starting now my Citrix application. And this instance is a, is a published desktop. And when I'm signing in, uh, at the point I'm signed in, we already know the full context of this endpoint. So we know exactly what kind of UD pocket we are having, where the UD pocket is based, is the Wi-Fi encrypted or is not encrypted, is it a corporate Wi-Fi or not. And this information we use to define access to your virtual environment is just, as we call it here, context. I will explain later how we generate this context and what that means in details, but what we're doing in our first uh, demo is we're checking if the Wi-Fi we're using, if this is secured or not. And as we can see here, this is true, and therefore I can access my environment. What I'm doing now is I'm disconnecting um, my Citrix session, so leave the session running, and changing now on my endpoint, changing the wireless network. So let me do this. I'm using very popular in Germany. Telecom is an open uh, Wi-Fi network available in a lot of locations. And what I'm doing now is I'm reconnecting now with this device. Maybe it's a different location now. What I'm want, what I want to use back to my already running session. The context gets uh, gets um, called from the endpoint. The context is now available within the virtual session. Now we decided that the Wi-Fi is no longer secure because it's not encrypted. Uh, you don't get any access to your virtual environment anymore. And the message you see here is just the default. You can change that in different language. You can make a hint about the Wi-Fi needs to be encrypted or not. It's up to you what you want to write down. Behind the scenes, there is a timeout um, default uh, of two minutes. And if the user is not reacting, then we disconnect the session in this instance. So let me reset this back to my secure Wi-Fi. And you will see I still get access to my environment. This is a very simple example about conditional access based on the uh, Wi-Fi network I'm using. As you can see here, now I can log on and I can still work. This is just a simple example about conditional access with an IGL SYN client. The next use case I want to demonstrate to you, so let me sign out with this one is again, is a conditional access, but in this instance, I want to demonstrate to you conditional access on a Windows platform. So as you know, IHL is also uh, having their Windows IoT device or Windows 10 IoT devices. So everything I show you now with Windows works 100% the same as well with IHL. And in this instance, I want to demonstrate to you a conditional access based on the security state and the location the user is connecting from. So what I'm doing now is, um, as you can see here, this is my local device. And um, my local device, the firewall is in a great state. It's all green, it's all perfect, it's, it's, it's not bad. And what I'm doing now is I'm not using Citrix now. I want to show you also Amazon Workspaces, this, which we also support. Um, and in this instance, let me put my credentials in. I'm signing in to my environment. And um, let me do this. Remember, security state is good, so it's all fine. And if I try to sign in into my uh, Amazon workspace, I will see a message. So currently, the workspace is hosted in Ireland, and I'm sitting in Frankfurt. And here you can say, see an example about controlling access to a virtual environment based on the location you're coming from. So as we say here, you cannot work from this location. You need to log on from Frankfurt. But we can even control that uh, in combination with security as well. So this is something I want to show you now by moving to my Frankfurt office. And my Frankfurt office in this instance is my virtual Windows 7 environment to demonstrate it to you. And what I'm doing in this Windows uh, 7 uh, office called Frankfurt, I will disable one of the firewalls and do exactly the same kind of stuff again to sign into workspaces. And it is now my location, Frankfurt, but what you would see is I still can't log in because the security 
uh, is not met to allow access to my Amazon Workspace. Amazon Workspace, this is something we will support with the next release, will be available mid of April, called uh, Device Trust 18.1. And as you can see here now, I cannot log on because the security is not met. What's happened when the security state comes back, as it should be, you can see I can work immediately with my workspace. So this is um, just another technology besides Citrix and native Microsoft RDS, which we will support as well. But important uh, to mention also if I'm signed in and something happened now during session runtime, so for example, some malicious activities is ongoing on my endpoint or it is a user error, whatever, I'm changing the firewall you can see we can immediately identify this context change on the endpoint and can act within the virtual session and we can prevent access to your environment. If the security state comes back, we can release a session and you can still work on, uh, on your virtual environment. So this is just an example or an, an additional example about conditional access. Uh, so the first one was about the Wi-Fi network we used. The second one was about the security state and the corporate location. So we could combine all this information to define a real con uh, contextual access to your environment. The next use case I want to demonstrate to you is about, let me go back to your to my IHL endpoint. In this instance, I want to demonstrate to you that we can, we can also act on log on or reconnect, but we can also work within the session if something happened within the session. And this is something I like to demonstrate now to you. For that, I need to change my user and I want to use a different user account for that. So this is now use case 12. In this use case, I want to demonstrate to you that we can make application availability dependent on the context. So what we're doing here is again, um, remember, we are connected with a secure Wi-Fi network. So let me check in. I explain later on the technology, how that works and how we work with the, with the architecture with this, how we get the context into the virtual environment. So as you see, I'm, I'm currently logged on again. We're checking again Wi-Fi security state, but in this instance, we are not controlling access to the virtual environment. In this instance, we're controlling access to applications. So what we have done here is we have our super critical business application. Uh, in this instance, it's just Notepad++, but it could be any application you want to control based on context. And what I'm doing now is because um, the policy we used is if the Wi-Fi is secured, as we can see here, the user is allowed to use this business application. If the, if the Wi-Fi is not secure anymore, you're not allowed to run this application. And this is something I want to demonstrate to you. So let me disconnect again. Could also log off and can do a fresh log on, changing the Wi-Fi now on the endpoint to my open Wi-Fi and re-sign in or reconnect to my virtual environment. In this instance, what's happened now, we identify now, oh, this is not a secure Wi-Fi by our definition anymore. And therefore, we control the policy which controls access to this business application. So if you check this here, you see now the Wi-Fi is not secure anymore. And if I try to start this application, it's impossible to start this application again. And the technology we're using to control this kind of application access is we're using Microsoft AppLocker. I think you guys are aware about Microsoft AppLocker as part of each of a server operating system. And the AppLocker by design can be configured by user group memberships on the logon. We have a technology which enables us to fully dynamically control the AppLocker based on the context. That even works if the application was executed and um, for example, so it's a classic use case beside Wi-Fi is also a user executes an application from inside the corporate network, disconnects the session and reconnects from a different location. You want to prevent access to this application. This also works with device trust. I want to demonstrate that to you as well. So what I'm doing, I'm going back to my uh, Wi-Fi settings and reset that to my corporate Wi-Fi or to a Wi-Fi network, which is encrypted. Let me sign in again. And then you will see I'm allowed to run this application as you have seen before. 
Um, this is a part of our technology here, Connecting2. I will explain that later on, what that is in detail and how that works and what we're doing at that point. Um, so let me show you this second part of that use case if I let, let the application running. So one second. So what I'm doing now is I leave the application running. I'm disconnecting now and um, go back to my unsecure Wi-Fi so we can even control that scenario um, and can close down the application as well. So one second. And the Wi-Fi is just an example. We can control application availability to anything. We can make it based on the location. We can make it based on the actual device you're using. We can make it on the hardware you're using. We can even make it uh, dependent on the geolocation you're using, network, etc. What you see here now is a message box to the user. This is not normally 10 seconds. It's a bit too short. So we can control that. You can control the content here, what you want to display. The application gets closed down. And if the users try to execute this application again, it's not possible. This use case was purely about App Locker, but we can also use uh, uh, Absence Application Manager, now Ivanti Application Control, or any other technology which is in place. The context, when we talk about context, this is exactly an extract from context we're looking for, we're using in the customer scenario. So this was the one we used all the time now, but we are, as you can see, there's different things like how the user is accessing my environment, from what corporate location user is coming from, country, as Jens was saying, if it's a managed device or is this an unmanaged device, um, this dev is a device secure, etc. And all this context gets logically combined based on context properties. So what we're doing, um, we deliver all these context properties into the virtual environment on log on, on reconnect, and we make sure it's always up to date during session runtime. And what you can see here now, and this is just one place where you can consume it as a registry, uh, lots of information starting with device and everything here which starts with device represents my endpoint so as you can see there are hardware related information you can go really down to the model where the ud pocket is plugged in we have all the display settings and here a very interesting one is the dpi setting so you can we can automatically set the right dpi settings into the citrix environment which are dependent on the endpoint and this fully dynamically without any user interaction um, we have information about the input methods. We have the geolocation. And as you can see here, we, go, we can go down really to the building number. But for sure, we have in most of the scenarios, customers want to know the country code. Maybe they want to know the state and the town, and that's it. We can do this because we can disable things we are not looking for. I'll show you later on. Then we have the device name. We have all network uh, information here. I jump to the Wi-Fi one. Um, this is a Wi-Fi network I'm currently using. And you see, I can have I have all information about the endpoint, about the network I'm using, including gateway, gateway MAC address. This is a very nice thing to identify corporate locations. We have all the Wi-Fi um, information, like if so the Wi-Fi is secured or not, you can see it's open, what SSID are you using, etc. And this is what we call context properties. And those are all context properties, as you can see, representing my IHL endpoint currently connected to my environment. On a Windows platform, we have some more information I will show you later on. And it ended up with uh, who is information, which is the internet service provider I'm using for my current location. We have the same information. We can, we can have the same information about the Citrix server itself as well, but we have um, we have configured or disabled some of the information, so everything starts with host, it represents my Citrix environment. The interesting piece here is the bandwidth and the latency is currently used for my session. So if, if this is changing, we can act on that. So if the latency goes up to 100 or 800 milliseconds, uh, 80 milliseconds, so we can act on that by notifying the user. This is what we call context properties, and those context properties are used logically combined to define the context I'm looking for. And based on the context, we can act within the virtual world, as you have seen with AppLocker, but we can do also the same uh, to control access to your virtual environment. And we don't care how the session gets established through Netscaler, through LAN, uh, through traditional uh, VPN solution. This all done, doesn't count. We make the context available, one, in the registry. We can make it available in the environment variables. We can make it available as well in command line with a command line utility. So it's up to you how you want to consume this context. But we go even further. 
So, uh, for example, this is my first Citrix session I'm connected to. And what I'm doing now, I'm starting now a double hub. So this is also a very traditional use case within our customer. So what I'm doing now from the first Citrix session, I start now an additional um, published application or published desktop. So what I've done here, I used now a, an additional published desktop to show you the integration. And in this second, or we call this double hop environment, I also have all information about the endpoint itself as well. So uh, if I look deeper into the properties, you can see exactly the same information you saw in the first uh, session. The only things we added to the second, uh, to the double hop, is the information about the first hop. So I know exactly where this user was coming from. So this is what we call double hop support, uh, which we can also support uh, the context information. So let's sign out here. Another use case, um, let me jump out of that. Now we need now a different device. So we need now the UD5. Let's shadow this device. The next use case I want to show you is a very traditional one. It's about uh, corporate locations you're coming from to assign network printers and shares, etc., and applications. In this instance, what I'm using my uh, UTC is uh, my UT5 is connected here to my local area network, and I'm signing in now. And based on my corporate office now, which is defined in this instance by um, by network properties and geolocation information we're combining together, we, we can define in what uh, corporate office you're using. So let's, let's sign in. And if we are signed in, we will see based on the context um, what corporate location we are using. So come on. Something all right. Okay, let's quickly log off and log on again. It should work. Uh, something is not right. Okay, let, let's go over to the Windows side to show you that first and then going back to um, to the iChip. So what we have here, this is now again my Frankfurt location. And what I want to demonstrate in this one, I'm connecting now to my Citrix environment. What we use, as I said before, we're checking a lot of uh, information, defining the corporate location you're coming from. And in this instance, you get all the uh, resources um, connected, which belongs to your environment. Well, it looks like the server is uh, hanging. Interesting. This is, yes, you see, guys, this is live. So we're showing everything live. And I need to see shortly what's wrong with the Citrix server. It looks like it's okay. Something is wrong. Let me try again. Uh, let me see. No, it's all fine. So it should work. So we should sign in now. Oh, that looks better. That looks how it should be. So, okay. So let's go into this. And now something is wrong. That's interesting. Uh, we tried it a couple of times. We're using this demo environment all the time. But it looks like it's currently do not want to do this. So one second, so let me check another user. Let's go back to here. This is all signed in, should. So, So just have on the other <clears throat> on the other side, I see the uh, the server, but it's not reporting any issues. It's interesting. Ah, now it's working. Maybe there was some updates or something. There. Let's see. Okay. So what I want to what I wanted to demonstrate to you was the information about um, the corporate office we're using, and based on the corporate office information, we um, we uh, map the right corporate resources. In this instance, I'm 
by our definition, this is my current location, is our corporate office Darmstadt. And based on that, I should get my, uh, my resources, but not with this use case. So let me try that here again. Sorry, guys, for that. Um, let me try that again. So I'm looking for that server, but it looks all okay. So hopefully this is working now for this use case. Come on. Come on. Uh, something is wrong. So sorry, guys. I need to. Um, I could not show you that. No idea what's wrong with this user at the moment. So let's go back. I need to jump. Um, I need to leave that use case. But I think um, you can, you believe in me. We can uh, we can assign uh, look, um, uh, corporate resources based on your corporate location you're coming from. By the way, we have all this kind of videos, which I want to sh uh, or all the use case I want to demonstrate to you is part of our. Uh, website. So if you go to devicetrust.com product, you see first of all a lot of information about the technical benefits and we show you also what kind of context properties we are collecting from the endpoint and we are able to demonstrate. And if you open that is a little bit of an uh, explanation. And on the end, you see all the videos to all these different use cases I've already sh uh, showed you or I want to show you, including the ITIL use case we see here, also how we integrate with Citrix WEM as an example. So let's go back. Uh, it's still a black screen, so um, yeah, I could not show you this use case. So let's go back to, um, to my demo use case and I want to show you a little bit the, uh, the, the window side. So let's go back to here. So with this use case, um, I just want to show you uh, the additional properties we can get, collect on the window side. So as you can see here, there's we have more information like the action center information about the firewall antivirus information we can get. We can also check certificates uh, are installed on the endpoint to identify if it's a corporate managed device or not. We will also implement that on the ITIL side on the next release. Uh, so we can check uh, certificates. Um, we have uh, information about the hardware, including is this a mobile device, which we also add to IHL soon. We have uh, logical disk and map drives information. This is to, um, for example, to, um, to do the Citrix client drive policy um, based on what kind of network drives are available to optimize them that, for example, corporate network shares are not get reconnected into the virtual environment because it's easier to connect them straight in the, from within the virtual environment. Uh, we have policy information, power information. We have all kinds of printer information. We have information about the remoting client, how the remoting client is accessing my virtual environment. We have screensaver information, which I want to show you a bit more in detail in the next use case. And uh, what kind of user we have, how is the user authenticated, what kind of rights the user has, etc. And also on the Windows side and also on the uh, ITIL Windows 10 IoT build, we have information about the Windows Defender. We have firewall information with inbound and outbound rules. And we have Windows update information if any critical Windows update is missing. So this is just a little bit of an overview about uh, what we're doing on the Windows side. So let's go back now to the architecture, how we're doing all this kind of stuff. And that's also quite important to understand because it's very simple. Um, so what we're doing is, as you can see here, this is our architecture diagram for Windows endpoints and IGL endpoints. So with this in the center, this is my Xenap machine. This is my Citrix server, my Xenap server, my Amazon workspace, whatever you're using here. And on this side, we need to install a little piece of software called the Device Trust Host. The Device Trust Host is nothing else as an MSI package. It needs to be installed. We don't need any additional infrastructure. That's very important. So you don't need to install a SQL database or a web service or something to use Device Trust. The only thing you need to install here is the Device Trust Host. What, whatever the Device Device Trust host or what Device Trust should do is defined by group policy. I won't show you later. And whatever Device Trust is doing is writing that into the event log because our customers telling us, please don't create your own reporting. We already have reporting in place. So please in, provide the information into the Microsoft event log, for example. Um, on the client side, as we discussed already with iGROS, there's a piece of software running. The importance here is 
you don't need to manage this device trust line. The device trust line just needs to be installed. And on the Windows side, it's a, it's a one-click installer. Then we can do an auto update on that. On the ITIL side, is as I, see, as I showed you before, it's just to enable device trust. That's it. The magic starts when the device trust line talks to the device trust host. So however the ICA session in our instance gets established through Netscaler, through LAN, through VPN, whatever, the client starts to talk to the host and they're exchanging information like uh, what kind of client version you have on Windows, for example, we can push you to upgrade. And if this is all done, then the device trust host could tell the client, you look what, I only want to get this 20 information from you. Then the host sends down a little config to the client. The client, the client reads this config and up uh, and send over the information you're looking for. This is, I want to demonstrate to you uh, quickly uh, how easy that is. So one second, I'm move now away from that screen and show you the Citrix server I'm connected to. So this is the Citrix server I'm always connected to in my demo environment. And as part of the configuration we do with group policy, you can do this with group policy, as I said, you can do it with local policy. In this instance, I'm using a local policy. I'm not going through all the different settings here. The only thing I want to demonstrate to you how simple it is on a central point to disable certain properties you're not looking for. So I'm going to the device filter. And for example, if I'm looking for geolocation, I could easily decide I don't want to get any geolocation information. I just disable that. Or I can be very selective and just going into that and say, hey, I'm only interested in the country code in the state and maybe in the town. And that's the only information I want. And then device trust on the endpoint will only send this information to the host. And that's important to understand though. There's no need for you to manually configure the device trust line. Everything you do, you do here on the central point. And then the device trust line will pick up this configuration on the log on or on the reconnect read the configuration and just send the information you're looking for. That's the magic behind that. Um, on the other side, we are uh, writing everything we do, we write into the event log. So let's, I'm not good looking for all the different events we have here, but you can see there's lots of events. Uh, 101 is just a simple event which tells the user has been signed in and you can easily see what kind of context information was available within the session. We can even control that view. So for example, if you want to enable geolocation information within the session to control access, but you don't want to report on that, this might be a bit of a German thing, uh, you can do this. So we can also blacklist uh, some information out of the event. So this is, let's say, this is the, um, the architecture of device trust, simple, straightforward, no infrastructure required. You need to enable device trust on the client side and you need to have device trust on the host side and that's it, nothing more. So hopefully my demo goes back now. So let me try that again because there's one or two little uh, use cases I want to demonstrate to you as well. So hopefully this is working now. So let's try that again. Oh, this stays here. Okay, that's definitely something wrong. I need to look at that later on. So let's go back to my last use case I want to demonstrate to you. Uh, let me sign out and I use a different user account. This is now use case 13. And this use case, it's about a secure screensaver. So let me try to sign in to check if this is working. Um, and then I can demonstrate it to you. Hopefully, let me sign in. Oh, this is this connecting to. It's normally the, the point where the client talks to the host. The host exchange information with the client. The client gets all this information and send it over to the virtual environment. So but it looks like this is working. Perfect. Great. So in this instance, I want to demonstrate to you another very important use case. And this is, it has to do with screensaver settings. So we have requirements from the customers to say, um, if there's a secure screensaver on the endpoint configured, which meets my requirements, I don't need to add an additional screensaver into the Citrix world. It's, it's not really good for the user experience. And this is what I want to demonstrate to you. So what I'm doing now, I'm going to my Windows 10 device go to the lock screen settings, and just to want to show those settings to you. And this is what's defined on my endpoint. This could be defined by uh, group policies. It could be in this instance, a bring your own where the user have his own rights to define that. 
And when I look into the virtual environment, we're looking up for um, a context information called secure screensaver, which is true. By the way, this is all protected. So the user cannot modify that and could not take ownership. So this is all secured. But let's go into the screensaver settings. So one second. This is what we call the screensaver settings. So as you can see here, we have, this is the information we're collecting from the endpoint. So we know exactly if there's a screensaver, what kind of screensaver is used, if this is secure, and what it means is it's protected by, by a password. If a timeout kicks in, then the timeout is 15 minutes, as you can see here. So this meets my requirements as a customer, and therefore I have dynamically disabled the screensaver in the Citrix world. So what I'm doing to demonstrate that, that we also work on a, on a change, I change that now on the endpoint. You will see that this change is automatically updated within the virtual world. Screensaver is not secure anymore. We have updated the screensaver. And if I go out now and wait five seconds, you will see that the screensaver gets enabled within the virtual world. Um, and it kicks in with a password protection. This is not really um, a use case or timeout, which is for production environments because it's just five seconds. But it should demonstrate to you that we can set group policies or we can set policies within the virtual world fully dynamically and dependent on the context. So if you see now, screensaver is back to true. So it's a secure screensaver. So if I check the properties for that, you will see it's back to true. And if I go out now and wait five seconds, nothing happened anymore. So we have disabled the screensaver in that instance because the endpoint meets my requirements. Well, this is what I want to show, want to show you at the last um, uh, use case. The one I want to show you to, you to you, which was not working, I have a little video and I can show it quickly to you. One second. And then we can also go through this use case video as well. Uh, videos, technical, and I can show you that with Citrix WAM. It's just another technology we are supporting. And I just guide you through a little bit through this uh, demo. So what we're doing is this traditional log on. So I pause here for a moment. Just to remind you guys, this is our technology. This connecting to, this is exactly when the client talks to the host, exchanging all the information. By the way, you can also rename that. This is just the default uh, we have. So let's uh, continue with that. And then what we're doing based on the, uh, on the network properties, we define a corporate location. And Citrix WEM is using this context information to apply the right policy set within the virtual world. And this is what we're doing. We're using this information called Corporate Office Darmstadt. And based on that information, Citrix WEM in this instance is connecting resources within the session. So one is the network share for the location. And the other one is the default printer for the location the user is coming from. And this instance is Darmstadt. So what I'm doing now, I'm signing off or signing out for that. I'm just uh, forward this video a little bit. And this is now my Windows 7 endpoint, now with NetScaler logon, which is by our demo definition, our Frankfurt office. So I'll hurry up a little bit here. And then you can see here, Citrix is again using this information, applying the right policies. And what we're using here is the information that the corporate office is now Frankfurt, is no longer Darmstadt. This also works on a reconnect and disconnect. Um, but uh, as you can see here, now it's Frankfurt, the share. And the default printer is now configured back to my Frankfurt printer because the corporate location is different. If the corporate location not only needs to be a city or something, we also have customers having large uh, uh, buildings and large parks, business parks, and they want to know exactly where you are, like hospitals, for example. So we can also do this based on floors or based on the Wi-Fi access point you are connected to. If you if you roam with your device with different Wi-Fi access points, we could also work on that side. So that was my, uh, my last demo, which I would like to show you uh, in live, but I'm sorry for that, but you've seen what I want to show you. Um, last but not least, um, on our website, so if we go back to our website, you have all again these videos. You see all the different uh, context information we provide, and um, you also have access to our device trust context property. So this it will explain to you exactly what kind of properties you have on what kind of platform, including iGEL. And, and this is the last thing I want to tell you. So you can, if you want to know more about what kind of information we, uh, we are able to deliver, this is what you can see here. 
So in this instance, I would say um, I'm giving back to Jens um, for the wrap up. And if you ha guys have any technical questions, just raise it and we can go through. So back to you, Jens, please. Hey, Sasha, I do have one quick question for you. Okay. And that is, um, I'll read it. It says, so with Citrix Zen app or Zen desktop, is the information read from the agent slash client and then routed to the host inside the ICHDS HDX Correct. protocol? Perfect. Correct. Exactly. So we're using the virtual channels, no? In the, um, so as we call it in the old days, um, though that's what we're doing. So we use the virtual channels and therefore we don't care uh, what is between the client and the Citrix side um, because it's all transparent. Absolutely right. Any more questions, Doc? That's what I have. Guys, if you have any questions, please uh, use the questions piece and uh, we'll get to those. Um, but in the meantime, we'll turn it over to Jens because he has some neat stuff to, uh, to share with you that I think you guys will quite like. Okay. Okay, perfect. So thanks, Doug. Thanks, Sasha, uh, for the demonstration. So hopefully, yeah, uh, the idea was to show you um, how you can can use the, the, the context device that is providing into the virtual session with our actions and our triggers, how you can increase the, the security to, to come to a contextual security, be more flexible when, when the mobile workforce is accessing the virtual environment. One thing I'd really like to, to offer to you or, yeah, what to wrap up with is um, what we've created is we have um, set up an, an ideal community NFR license. So if you go to our website, um, devicerust.com slash community, you can um, sign up for a 12 month NFR license, clearly only for test and demo environments. So no productive use of this license, but you can use this um, this yeah, full full feature license to, to test around it, play around it, to do demonstration on it. Um, so we, can, can have access to that. Um, also, we, we, we offer you to, to support you with the implementation via, via web session um, to build up, for instance, um, use cases you have in mind, use cases you want to want to fulfill with, with device trust. We are happy to support you with that. Just get in touch with us. And of course, you can sign up to our um, device trust community program um, where you can get firsthand news updates around context awareness and now about what's going on, new versions coming out. As Sasha mentioned in April, there will be a new release um, where we add Amazon AWS support and much more. So you get you get first hand updates on that. If you'd like to want to get in touch, um, here are our contact details, so you can contact me or you can contact Sasha. And um, here are our contact details. Um, we are also happy to yeah follow up with with further web sessions, give you more details about it, and and as I said, we can support you with with implementation of the test environment and so on. Um, so yeah, that was it from my side. I think we are on time, which is good. So. Um, the only thing I can say is many thanks for your time, many thanks for, for watching our, our webinar, attending our webinar. Um, thanks to Sasha for, for doing the live demonstration, even if the, the backend system didn't want as we expected that. Um, but I think that's normal, can happen. Um, and many thanks to you, Doug, for, for hosting the session. Hey, thank you guys so much for, for you know coming on and sharing the amazing stuff you guys are doing. It's, it's just so simple, but yet so powerful. I truly love it. I actually wrote down a few questions myself, and as Sasha went through it, he literally answered each one of them. So uh, <laughs> that was probably quite impressive, but did not surprise me. Guys, listen, if you if, uh, are watching, uh, if you enjoyed it, please let us you know let us know. Uh, tweet about it if you would. Uh, include at IGEL community and of course at device trust. We def definitely love that. And if you have any recommendations for future webinars that you would like, uh, you know, we us to do through the IGEL community, please let me know. Brown at IGEL.com or hit me up on Slack. Uh, you know, definitely let me know because that would be absolutely great. Uh, the community is for, you know, by the techies for the techies. So, uh, you know, it's uh, if you guys have any recommendations, wishes, desires whatsoever, please let me know. On that note, um, I would also, uh, these guys are giving you guys, uh, you know, free NFRs, and I'd like to extend that to a free uh, UD Pocket. So if you do not already have the IGEL UD Pocket, please let me know, and I will make sure you get one. So just send me an email, brown at igel.com with your address. If you're in Europe uh, or anywhere outside the U.S., you have to uh, add your phone number because we need that for shipping purposes. But uh Send me an email and I'll make sure you get one of those bad boys. It's a really amazing device and what have you. Uh, I already mentioned to join the iGel community, iGelcommunity.com. 
but also I want to share with you, if you don't know, um, we put together a very nice how-to document. So if, you, if you're new to IGEL, uh, it'll get you up and running quite quick. So I think in about within an hour, you have the entire platform up and running and uh, with no questions asked. So it's, um, I'm quite proud of that little piece of work. So I, I would love to know what you, you know, I'd love to share it with you guys. And if you have any suggestions, please let us know. Um, there's no other questions. That's uh, Sasha, you did such a good job. You answered everybody's question. <laughs> so uh, that's always a good thing. We're two minutes to the top of the hour. If there's any questions whatsoever you need to ask right now, if not, then we'll go ahead and call this a webinar. So guys, thank yeah, you. I so think it's it's just one comment. Um, it's also, Doug, you guys, if you have any questions, just write me an email or uh, contact me on LinkedIn or contact Jens. So I'm really happy to follow up with you on any kind of questions. Or if you want to trial it, uh, I will assist you, as Jens was saying. Thank you also from my side. Over to Doug again. Sorry, Doug. No, no, that's perfect. I was going to ask you to give you guys the last words. So, um, yeah, with no further ado, uh, let's just call this a webinar. Uh, I will make sure you guys all get the recorded version and uh, please share it with a friend, tweet about it uh, um, and, and try it. You know, that's, as I always say, try it for yourself. So with no further ado, let's just say thank you very much. And this was a, uh, in my opinion, a very successful first Agile community webinar. So uh, Sasha, Jens, thank you so much for doing this for us, with us. Thank you also from my, from my side and thank you guys for listening. Thank you. Okie dokie. That's a wrap, folks. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.